Good morning. Glad you're here in the new year. <laughs> yes, glad you're here in the new year. Uh, at Prairie Lakes, first thing we always want to do is just say that we're glad all the campuses are with us. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, we're glad that you are, and we're happy to serve you. Uh, the next thing that we always want to do here at Prairie Lakes is get our Bibles out. So all around you, there's Bibles under chairs, um, down the row. If there's not one by you, elbow someone, and I'm sure they can get it for you. Uh, and there's also on the back of your no uh, bulletin, there's a place for notes. So if you're a note taker, or you want to start taking notes in the new year, uh, go ahead and get your hand up and the ushers will come down with uh, buckets of pens and they can get one of those for you, okay? So just kind of those general housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, if you're new here at Prairie Lakes, it's a new year, so a lot of us are starting new things. Uh, here at Prairie Lakes, our mission is to make it impossible to get to hell from Iowa. And how we want to do that is to keep launching campuses in big Iowa that will launch disciples into little Iowa. So that's what we're about. And one way we're doing it is we're raising up young leaders and investing in young men and women who can lead the church someday. And so uh, I'm benefiting from that. So I'm just glad and I want to say thanks to you as Prairie Lakes for investing in people like me. Um, but as we get started, uh, the new year brings a lot of things, and one place where the new year is highlighted is on the internet. Uh, the internet loves the new year. <laughs> and one, one thing I'm a part of, there's a, a social media uh, site called Twitter. Uh, some of you may be a part of it, some of you uh, at least know what it is, and if you don't, uh, it, it's a, a place where people can say things they want to say to other people who want to hear what they have to say. Um, and on, on Twitter, I, I thought there was a clever, someone explained Twitter to their son and posted it for the people to see. So if you don't know what it is or if you do, I thought this was clever. The, the son asked his dad, he said, Dad, what is Twitter? What do you keep talking about? And the dad said, son, you know how uh, when we let our dog out in the backyard and he barks, and then all the other dogs in the neighborhood start barking back at it. Twitter's like that, but it happens all day and all night, all year long. So that's what Twitter is. Uh, and one thing that happened is there was something that was trending on there. And it was this, this thing where people were trying to describe their New Year's resolution in five words. So people were posting five word resolutions for everyone to see. And I thought they were uh, pretty interesting and entertaining. So I grabbed a few to share with you. So here they are. Uh, these were random people. I don't know who they were. But one, one guy said, eat a lot more pizza. That was his resolution in five words. Create more than I consume. Entrust more things to God. Eat way less peanut butter. Receive acceptance letter from Hogwarts. <laughs> Trick my kids into obeying. And a favorite of mine, some young man said, become less awkward, get girlfriend. <laughs> so the internet had fun with the new year and a lot of us do too. What, just if you would with me, if you made a resolution this year, would you show your hand to me? Who made resolutions this year? That's fantastic. I'm glad you did. I, I have been so excited to uh, just study this and prepare this and uh, get ready to share this with you. It's been uh, a grace to me, so I hope it is to you too. But I have some resolutions. And one thing, uh, if you have made resolutions that that tells me about you, uh, it kind of exposes something that's true of you. Uh, if you have a resolution, uh, and maybe if you haven't actually made one or thought of one, one thing that you've done is you've thought about uh, in 2015, my life consisted of all these things, and since I made a resolution, I'm saying that in 2016, I want them to be better than they were in 2015. Uh, there's a way that it should be or could be this year that it wasn't last year, and so I'm sort of craving for a better year next year. Uh, that's sort of what we admit when we make resolutions. That's true of us, and so uh, what we're going to expose about us today, all of us, is that there's something inside of you, something inside of me, uh, because we're humans, we exist as part of humanity, something ex inside of us that craves newness. We just know and we feel things just aren't how they should be or could be. They're not happening how they were intended or designed to. And so we do things like make resolutions that expose this about us, 
It's true of us, whether we realize it or make resolutions or not, that we're craving for things to be better than they were or things that are bad, we want them to get good. Things that are okay, we want them to be better than they have been. Things that are broken, we want them to be fixed. Uh, That's just true of us. We sort of crave these things. And the new year is just a great opportunity to talk about it because we think back and we we kind of ponder, how, how was last year? How will this next year be? What should be or could be different about it? How can I improve? Uh, so this is a great time to talk about what's happening inside of you uh, when you crave these sort of things. And in 2016, a, as a country, just us as Americans and Iowans, we are gonna spend absurd amounts of time and money and energy on our resolutions. We are. It's just true. Every year, the, the stats that people come out with are unfathomable, the amount of time and money we spend uh, trying to be less depressed and more happy. We're going to pursue that like crazy as a people. And that's okay. We're, we're doing these things because it's showing us that we're craving something to be new. So we want to be less depressed and more happy. Uh, we want to be like that mom who we see on Pinterest. We want to do the craft that she does and raise our kids the way she is too. We want to be more like that mom and less like the mom we were. We want to have the six pack like the guy on the magazine that we keep seeing. That's who we want to be. We want to have less anxiety and be more at peace. So in 2016, we're going to pursue that like crazy. What I'm just here to say today is as we crave these new sorts of things, these these things that show us, ah, it's just not quite how I think it should be and I want it to be different. As those things come up, It's exposing something that's true about us. So if we are going to talk today about what's true about us as humans or about humanity or what we were made to do or not do or how things should be or could be, uh, a great place to start for us today uh, is in when humanity was created. So if you would, uh, in your Bibles with me, turn to the book of Genesis Uh, The very first book of the Bible, uh, just open your Bible and a couple pages in uh, will already be in Genesis. And we're going to just look at chapter one uh, at the creation story when God created uh, humanity. And we're going to start in verse 26. So then God said, after creating all the rest of creation, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God created humanity and all of creation to live in this unhindered, unbroken relationship with him as creator. That's what we were intended to do and it was good because our God is good. He made us uh, to live and exist in a world where things weren't broken, where we were perfectly in relationship with him as God. But now uh, in 2016, we're making resolutions because things aren't as good as we think they could be. And that's exposing something about us. It's exposing uh, God made it this way back then, uh, but now we are trying to fix it. We, we're craving newness that we don't have. And our desire for newness shows that maybe things aren't exactly how they were when God created us. Maybe we're not living exactly how he had intended us to. And so we're just getting that exposed about us. Um, and indeed, as people who God said he was going to make us as humans in his image, as image bearers of God, we were made uh, to image him to creation, to one another, to reign and rule over, over creation and be in relationship with him. And since we aren't, uh, something must have happened. So if you would, uh, I'm sure it took humanity a while, right, to mess up what God made like in the middle of this book or something we must have messed up? No, uh, it took three chapters. So if you would just turn one page over with me to Genesis chapter three, uh, and we'll see how the way we were intended to live all of a sudden got broken uh, and something caused us to crave the newness we do today. So in Genesis chapter three, uh, if you would with me, I'm gonna read uh, starting in verse one. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, the serpent did, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And can I pause there for a second? Think about how many times today in 2016, uh, when you're tempted to do something or believe something, how often is someone or some message or some societal norm saying to you, has God really said? Is that really what God said? That's just such a common temptation we hear now. Uh, but let's get back into it. So verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So God created us one way to live a certain way, uh, to be in this unhindered relationship with him. And then it only took us three chapters to mess that up, to break the relationship we had with God and with creation. And so now uh, what Adam and Eve did in sinning that day, we continue to do today and we continue to live in this state where we're broken in our relationship with God and we continue to break it over and over as we live uh, in sin and make decisions and have attitudes uh, and thoughts. So what we're talking about today then is in that moment when Adam and Eve sinned, it started this common thread, a thread that exists throughout human history that we can see as we look back uh, in our history books. A thread started to exist in, in humanity where we crave newness. We were made for one thing and now all of a sudden we aren't living the way we were intended to and we feel that. We feel it deep down and all of humanity does so we crave to be back the way that we were intended to be living, to be in relationship with our creator the way we were intended to. So human history, uh, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with your specific circumstance or this specific year or your specific culture or generation. Instead, what exists in, in, in us when we crave newness, it transcends our culture and our generation. It transcends your ethnicity and your socioeconomic status. It transcends all of those things because as we belong to the human race uh, have been separated from God in our sin, we crave newness because we want to get back to that. And so the new year uh, is a time where this starts to get exposed and shown in us and about us and starts to be proven to be true. So resolutions is one thing that just shows this newness that we're craving, this way that we're wanting to be back, living the way we're intended to that we aren't now. So resolutions is just one of those things. Uh, some other ways that our craving for newness is exposed and these have been all just so true of me. Uh, when it's winter, how long has, I know winter technically starts on a certain date, but winter has only been bad for us as Iowans for about a week now, right? Like we hit Christmas and the snow was pretty and stuff and now it's kind of old, right? So it's been winter for one week and I'm already craving the newness of spring. <laughs> like I want the newness of spring to come. And I know my neighbor, Matt, who I see snow blowing all the neighbor's driveways on the street in one morning. Matt's ready for newness of spring too. I know that he is. Uh, the same thing happens in summer. I'll be so happy for it to be summer. And then when there's three days in a row of 90 and humid, I'm ready for the crisp breeze of fall, right? Our, uh, my craving for the newness of fall just gets exposed. Uh, as a student who's finishing up my master's, uh, when the semester starts at the end of January, I'm gonna be immediately ready for spring break. Just right when school starts, I'm ready for spring break. And then I'll come back from spring break and I know it's gonna happen. The first day that school starts after spring break, I'm gonna be ready for fall, or for summer, I mean. I'll be ready for the end of the, of the semester. I'll be ready for the newness that comes with it. Another way that our craving gets exposed is when it's Thursday, you're ready for Saturday. You are, you sit at work or you're at home and you're ready for your husband to be back with you or you're ready for the work day to end or you're ready for the weekend to come because it's Thursday and we just want the newness of the weekend. We want that. The same thing happens when we're saving for vacation. We've been working a lot, working hard, saving up our hours and our money, 
preparing and planning, and we want the newness that comes with vacation. Uh, and all of these things, they aren't bad. That's the thing about a lot of these ways that our newness, our craving for newness is exposed, is they aren't bad. They're just showing that there's something deep inside of us that exists in all of us that says, man, uh, I want things to be different than they are. Like, the weekend sounds better than Thursday. It just does, and I, and I don't know why necessarily, but I want something different than how it is. Uh, it could be or should be different. So this is true in those ways, but it's also true in things like our relationships. Um, in 2016, you generally want your marriage to be better than it was in 2015. You just do. Uh, in 2016, you want your friendships to be better. You want to be in a healthier state in your body. You do, and these things are good. They just show that there's something inside of us pushing us this way. So the problem, the problem that we have now today in 2016 is this. We were created uh, by God to live one way, to be a certain type of people who function in certain ways, who are living unhindered, unbroken, uh, flourishing relationships with God and the rest of creation. That's what we were created for. And we are just in this long line of human history of people that are craving that relationship, craving that newness, craving to have what we were intended for and not having it. And it's getting exposed in all sorts of ways. So that's our problem today. Uh, we were made for one thing and we aren't living that way. And so now uh, we're sort of groping around in the dark, looking for ways to have the newness that we feel like we need. And that's our problem and where we are today. Uh, and I am so glad and happy that I'm here to tell you that God has the answer for your craving. Uh, God has what you have been craving, the newness that you've been craving that we notice in the new year. God has that. And we all crave newness. Uh, and Jesus is the only thing that can satisfy our newness. Because here's the deal. Uh, we pursue newness in different ways. It's not and they're not necessarily bad. Some ways we pursue newness are bad, but they aren't necessarily that always bad. Um, but when sin entered the world, something happened. God made us one way in Genesis 1, and then two chapters later in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered the world. But in that same chapter, God knew that sin had broken the relationship between him and his creation. He knew that things weren't right and that we were going to be trying all sorts of ways to satisfy our craving that we now had an empty hole with. And so God knowing that in the same chapter that Adam and Eve sinned in in Genesis 3, that very same chapter a few verses later in verse 15, God promised uh, to us that someday he would be the agent of reconciliation and giving us the newness that we crave and helping us to live the way he's in, designed us and wanted us to, to help us be back in that state of flourishing with God and creation. In the third chapter of the Bible, God was already planning for this to happen and to come to us. And so now we, uh, we get to be the beneficiaries of that and we get to see the ways that Jesus satisfies our craving. Uh, we just got done with our Christmas series. Uh, if you were here, uh, I'm glad that you were. And if you weren't, what we talked about was how uh, Jesus, God, arrived in humanity. He became fully God and fully man and rescued and redeemed uh, what was broken in the world, namely us, uh, and redeemed it and able to give us the opportunity to be reconciled back to God. So as Jesus arrived to us, we get to see sort of this break in human history where everything we've known before Jesus came were these people trying to have what they were intended to and they couldn't do it. And then Jesus comes and now all of a sudden we begin this climb back to living the way we were intended to, to the flourishing that God meant for his people and for his creation. So if you would, uh, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians um, it's in the New Testament, right after the, the first four Gospels. Then there's Acts and Romans, and then 1 Corinthians, and then 2. So if you would turn there with me, that would be great. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote this book. Uh, it was a letter to the church in Corinth. And what Paul is talking about is 
when Jesus, who satisfies our craving for newness, when he entered the world, uh, we all of a sudden had this rescuing uh, uh, from Jesus who arrived and lived the life that we couldn't and died the death that we should and did it for us in our place. And now Paul is talking and explaining this to the church at Corinth and we get to read uh, the same things that they heard then. So if you would, uh, chapter five, and I'm gonna read uh, verse, starting at verse 17. Paul wrote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Now, some of us have heard this verse, and then maybe it's getting, I mean, we've heard it enough, so we're kind of numb to it. But although we're reading about the new creation, the new is here that's come, if you look with me at verse 18, we get to see how that came. All this, the newness, is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So, what's Paul saying? Paul is saying that God made us one way. We've been living in this broken world and our broken selves that haven't been able to have the newness we've craved. And now all of a sudden in Jesus, something happened. Something was made available to us now. And it's that Jesus gave us the opportunity to be reconciled to God. Uh, who we are as humans in our, in our first nature, in the old nature before the new comes, who we are is, is we are a sinful people who crave other things than God. Uh, our cravings for newness are exposed in wrong ways. We don't live how we were intended to. And so what we talk about here at Prairie Lakes is this thing called the faith line. And what that means is for us as people who uh, live in sin, what it means is we get to in Jesus be reconciled to God and how we can be reconciled is we can turn away from our sin we can say I don't I don't want to sin anymore I don't want to live in that I don't want to live that way I don't want to desire it I don't want that to be what's true about me and instead uh, Jesus I want to turn to you I want to see you and believe and have faith and trust in you as my Lord and Savior and so I'm going to turn away from my sin. I'm going to step over the faith line, Jesus, and put my faith and my trust in you. And as soon as that happens, what does Paul say? He says the old is gone and the new has come. So newness enters in. We get a bit of the newness that we crave. It happens because Jesus has reconciled us to God. And some of you who have stepped over the faith line, you are, are Christians and you know that just because you've been given a new nature doesn't mean uh, everything's better or your circumstances have changed or that your physical states are better or all of a sudden uh, things have been made perfect for you or that you don't desire sin anymore. When we're given the new nature that Paul tells us about, the thing we've been offered through Jesus and his reconciliation, when we're given that new nature, it's a definitive moment in your life where God transfers you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, where he adopts you in as part of his family. And that newness can never be tarnished. That newness is given to you as a gift through God, Jesus's work on your behalf, reconciling you to God. And that's the new nature you get to live in. So if you are here today uh, and you haven't stepped over that faith line that we talk about, if you've been living the life, that's not the life you were intended to. If you haven't been uh, basking in the relationship with God, the reconciled relationship with God that you're meant to live in, you are free today to step over that faith line, to turn from your sin, put faith in God, see Jesus as your savior, and to have that new nature come to you and to begin the process of being satisfied in Jesus, having your craving for newness satisfied. So if we're given the new nature when we're reconciled with Jesus, then what happens to us then as Christians? What happens when we step over the faith line? Uh, if, if you would keep reading with me, we'll just finish verse 18 and I'll start in 19. The ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
So another way that Jesus satisfies our cravings is that we are being made new. Not only can you be made new when you step over the faith line, but once you do, then you're being made new. Uh, this is what the Bible calls sanctification. Uh, it, that can be an intimidating word, but what, what sanctification is, is it's this progressive work of God and man. So God and you, the Christian, progressively working to be made more and more and more like Jesus in your everyday life. And so that's the journey we're on, and, and it's the grace of God making us more like Jesus, but we uh, as Christians have a part to play in it, and it's effort. Uh, we get to give effort in our journey of being made more and more new. And here's the really, really neat thing. Uh, the goal of your sanctification of your Christian life is for you to have joy. I, like, do you realize that? That, that was so life-giving for me this week as I was looking at, so God created us uh, to live in this certain way uh, with these certain desires, to live in this perfect relationship with him. And now with sin in our lives and in our hearts and in the world, we're living not the way we we're intended to, uh, but I was made to live a certain way. So as soon as I step over the faith line, God makes me new and then keeps making me more and more new. I get closer and closer to the way that I was intended to live. And as we live more and more how we were supposed to and designed to and created to, that's joy bringing because we're actually doing what we were meant to do. Isn't that great? And so God, as he works in us to do that, we get to play a part. Uh, and so one way that you and me play a part in that process uh, is fighting our sin with the goal of our joy. The new nature has come, but we still have to fight, fight our sin and turn from it. We still get to see that if we live how God intended us to, the more joy we'll have. We have to work that way. Uh, as I was thinking about this and preparing it, a few people came to my mind who have just been great, uh, inspiring examples for me of how to turn from sin and fight it in the Christian life and to keep working towards uh, being made more and more like Jesus. One of them is a great friend of mine named Jeff. Uh, all of us, <laughs> something that's just natural for us now in this fallen world is that we're selfish. More often than not, we are selfish. And so one way that Jeff, my friend Jeff, fights this is he's married and has been married for a long time. And one thing he does really well is he serves his wife, serves her well. He uh, takes care of her when he can. He isn't selfish with his words. He tells her what he feels and thinks and has affections for her, uh, serves her by taking care of her and providing for her and protecting her. He does it really well. So when Jeff feels selfish, uh, the way that he fights his sin is to serve his wife well. And I thought that was really neat. Uh, I have another friend named Jason who started realizing that as he spent time with his five kids and his wife, that oftentimes he would notice himself just pulling his phone out and being on his phone and feeling like he wasn't present with the family that he was uh, protecting and providing and creating for. And so what Jason did was he got rid of his iPhone and got a flip phone. Uh, which was very commendable of him, uh, but just such a neat way to, to, for him to say, uh, I don't think I'm living how I should. I'm being selfish with my time by not being present with my family. So I'm going to do something drastic uh, in order to be more present with them. That was a neat example for me, and I thought it was really, really neat. Uh, there's some, some ladies who I know who struggle with comparing themselves to other women around them. Sometimes it's that one mom who always puts perfect pictures on Instagram or has that blog with those perfect crafts that she makes. And so uh, they find themselves seeing someone and comparing themselves to her or knowing someone and finding themselves living in this life where they're just constantly comparing. And that's not how they were intended to live. So what they do now to fight that sin is every time they feel the urge to compare themselves in an unhealthy way to another woman, what they do is they just say, I'm gonna identify one thing about her that she does and a way that she bears God's image well. Whether it's she is uh, a beautiful woman and so I'm happy that she is, or she loves her kids so well and I'm happy that she does. She's so creative in how she makes craft and I'm happy that she does. And that was just a neat thing for me to go, wow, like there's people doing really neat practical things to be more and more like Jesus, to be living uh, on the journey of being made more and more, to live the way that they were intended to. 
And that's been neat for me to watch. Another thing that we read about in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians uh, as part of our sanctification is that we are agents of reconciliation. We get to mend things that are broken. Part of the fallen world we live in means that there's broken things around us. And we, uh, as Christians who have stepped over the faith line, get to play a part in making things right when they're wrong, uh, making things healed when they're hurt. So as Christ's ambassadors uh, for 2016 as a Christian, uh, work for your sanctification and mending relationships. Uh, a really, really neat experience I had about a month ago was one of my roommates from college. I lived with seven dudes uh, and we had fun and college was great. But one of them, he and I uh, slowly, the longer we lived together, stopped getting along so much. Um, and then just naturally stop spending as much time together. And there's sort of this awkward, like, uh, I, I respect you and I like you, but for some reason we just don't get along and it's weird and I don't know why. Uh, and then I got married and my wife and I moved to Phoenix. And then three years later, there's still this awkward relationship I had with him. And about a month ago, he and I were able to get together and have uh, some time together for a couple hours just talking through that and figuring that out. And as he and I were reconciled, um, it was joy bringing because it was how we were intended to be in relationship with one another. But it also was just this tiny little picture. Think about it. He and I have known each other for maybe seven years, had some awkward years, three or four, and then all of a sudden we're reconciled. And the joy that it brought just from that small little picture of reconciliation, think about the joy that comes when you're reconciled with your creator. As creation that's separated from him in sin, when you're reconciled to God, the joy, the immense joy of that relationship being reconciled, uh, I got a little picture of that and it brought me joy. But to think about the, the joy that I have in my relationship with God now, the newness that Jesus was able to satisfy in my life uh, is amazing. It's amazing. So Jesus satisfies our craving for newness. One way he does it is that when you step over the faith line, you're given a new nature. Another way that he does it is that you're being made new. Once you step over the faith line, you begin a journey of being made new, being made more and more like Jesus so you can live the way that you were intended and created to live more and more. And then another way that Jesus satisfies our craving for newness is that we will all be made new someday ultimately new someday. Both the ways I've talked about so far have been sort of this spiritual reality that's happening that's true of us, but it's a, it's a spiritual thing. Sometimes it's hard to see or notice, but Jesus uh, someday is going to make all things new, and that'll be both spiritual and physical. We'll get to know and see and feel how that happens. So we're going to turn to Revelation. Uh, it's the very last book in your Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 21. So we started in Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible, and we're ending in Revelation 21, which is the second to last chapter of the Bible. Uh, the Apostle John that we read about a lot in the Gospels, who wrote uh, the Gospel of John, wrote the letter of Revelation, and we get to see now what he knew and experienced and was told about the end times. And so in chapter 21, I'm going to read verses 3 through 5 for us. And this is the picture, uh, the, the way that Jesus makes all things new someday. Our great hope, the craving that you have for newness, the ultimate way that that's satisfied is in the new creation with Jesus someday. So this is the ultimate satisfaction of that thing that exists in all of humanity. Uh, starting in verse three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. That today Church, that is our hope, our great hope, the great satisfaction of the newness that we crave, we get to read about and look forward to. Uh, someday Jesus is going to make all things new. So as your cravings 
get exposed in this new year, whether it's through a resolution or whether it's Thursday and you crave for it to be Saturday or whether it's the beginning of the semester and you want spring break to come, whatever way your cravings are getting exposed this year, just know that what your, your like soul and what your body's crying out for is to be made ultimately new in Jesus and to be with him in unhindered, unbroken, perfect relationship where humanity gets to flourish amongst creation the way we were intended to. Uh, that newness is spiritual, but it's also physical. I, I have two friends right now who are both fighting different kinds of cancer. Uh, one of them's a lot farther along than the other, but both of them right now, after stepping over the faith line, they've been given a new nature. They're being made more and more like Jesus, but they don't have the ultimate newness they crave. And someday when, when Jesus comes back and he makes all things new, they get the new body that they crave. There's things that are broken about them now that can't be fixed, but someday Jesus will fix them. Uh, when our kids go uh, off to school for the first time in elementary and get bullied and come home crying, there'll be no more tears someday. That won't happen. You won't feel the pain that comes from that. Uh, when you send your uh, children off to college and they have a hard time and don't make friends and then uh, have a, a terrible time there, like, that won't happen someday. There won't be leukemia. There won't be uh, things broken. Jesus is making all things new someday. And the craving that you have for that newness is answered and satisfied in one person, and his name is Jesus. So all of us, I hope, realize uh, that it's true, we crave that. And so if you're here today and you haven't stepped over the faith line, if you're still living uh, life in a way that you weren't intended to, if you're still uh, not in relationship with God, if you haven't been reconciled to him today, I can just tell you that life will continue to seem futile. It just will. It'll be hard. Um, and it's not that it gets easier. It's just that when you step over the faith line, you get the great hope that we just read about in Revelation 21. Jesus satisfies your craving and he will bring us home someday. And so if you haven't made that decision to step over the faith line, please do it today. Uh, begin the process of being made more and more new. Uh, if you have stepped over in 2016, Put effort into your sanctification. Become more and more like Jesus. Live the life that you were intended to more and more and more. Walk into the flourishing uh, that you were created to live in. Uh, and as you do, lots of joy, serious joy is going to come into your life. Uh, and I want much, nothing more than that for you today. Uh, and as our cravings get exposed this year, I don't know what those cravings are going to uh, bring out of you. But as they do, just remember when you're craving those, the newness of spring, <laughs> when you want the crisp breeze of fall to come, just let that remind you that something you're really craving is the newness that Jesus brings and that he's promised to do someday. And he's our great hope. So let me pray for us uh, and then we'll get done here this morning, okay? Father God, you, you are a good God. You created us wonderfully and beautifully and perfectly uh, and we are so looking forward to the day where we get to have a uh, perfect, unbroken, unhindered relationship with you. Thank you for being a God who hasn't asked us to work our way towards you, but instead has worked that way for us in Jesus. Thank you for bringing reconciliation for us that we couldn't earn or figure out or find by ourselves, God. We're thankful for you, and I pray that as uh, we go out today, this week, this month, and this year, um, that as we crave newness, God, you would just remind us of the newness that's uh, come to us in Jesus and that will come to us someday through him. Uh, so God, we love you and, and we're glad to be your people. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.